Ladies and gentlemen, uh, since you're also at the University of Johannesburg, I'd also like to welcome you in my own role as the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment. Uh, and I would also greet you in our four, multi four languages, uh, which is in uh, Sani Bonani, Yebo, uh, Dumelang, Khoimora, Khoida, Khoida. Khoimora for tomorrow morning. Uh, and good evening. Uh, la ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, quite privileged to have this uh, opportunity hosted by the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers as well as the as INCOSI and to present this topic. So the, the topic as you have been introduced is the decolonization of knowledge in engineering and the built environment and I know that some of you are here because you're also worried what this dean is going to say uh, and some of you are here because you have an idea of what I would say. So either way you're okay. Uh, the first, uh, uh, the, the speaker on the SAIE did warn us that this is an apolitical uh, sponsorship so I will keep it and my presentation will be similar. But you expected part of that. And ladies and gentlemen, as you know, and you expected that in the preamble, that the, the, this presentation is in fact inspired through the movements that has risen in South Africa over the last uh, two years, and perhaps more than two years, but perhaps we have only observed it in the last two years because it was heightened in the last two years. The topics that came about quite frequently on fees must fall. If you're wondering about where this image comes from, this image actually comes from the United Kingdom. But this topic, the hashtags through technology, through Twitter, actually became and made this topic a, a topic of global interest. The topic of fees must fall somehow embeds, and somebody said, which one came first? Was it the topic of decolonization that came first, or was it the topic of fees must fall? I don't know. It appears that one may have driven the other, but it appears that that may not have been the order in which the importance of these topics may have arisen. They are all, also, uh, you know, just to give you perspectives of how different and complex this topic is, uh, last year, it was actually in November 2015, it feels like last year, November 2015 when the protest actions were taking place and I had the opportunity to speak to a student, one of our students at the University of Johannesburg and I said, why do you present and propose, uh, you know, hashtag fees must fall, you know, uh, for all. Uh, you know, I know of some individuals that can certainly have their children and have their, th that they would be able to fund them. And the student explained to me his perspective of what it is that he has to go through, that he has to go through when he has to convince people that he, has to, that he is actually worthy, that he needs sponsorship, whether it's through NASFAS. And I very quickly started to realize that the call for all is more complex because it's not, it's, it's this process that individuals have to go for, and sometimes this is a process that takes one's dignity away. So the all component could be done, you know, the, it's not saying that there are individuals that, that can afford and should certainly contribute, but that contribution can be taken in, in different ways. At least that was that individual's uh, perspective in November 2015. But I'm trying to bring you the various different perspectives that come about also to say that many times when we look into the mirror, we sometimes see ourselves, sometimes we miss the world behind us. So, of course, you know, there are hashtags and uh, you would notice, and in case you're on Twitter, uh, you would notice that these are some hashtags that we tend to use. But on perspectives, I hope that some of you might be seeing a, a, a young lady in this image. Others might be seeing a musician. Uh, and similar to this, this topic today also has the components where decolonization has multiple meanings. In fact, it is not just a big word. By the way, the English dictionary uh, has uh, the average length of a word is, uh, is five. So this is really a big word. It's almost 14 characters, on the lighter side. On the other hand, if you look at that count of three or four, you can see two people looking at about the same set of, 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 uh, of logs and finding different, different numbers, different counts. So it is a word that has different meanings and different meanings to different people and also to different contexts. 
somebody was uh, once explaining that, you know, how do you be in, in Denmark or in Norway and talk about decolonization? And it was all about different perspectives where you start to acknowledge that there will be different viewpoints and those viewpoints are not necessarily dictated by your own uh, history, but it could be the high story of another person and another group depending on their own context. I do also say that the word, when we have our own debates, the University of Johannesburg does lead on topics of decolonization of knowledge, as you know, as a significant undertaking by the university. And when we talk about this topic, we are, we are careful that sometimes in the, in the heat of the moment the topic moves from decolonization of knowledge to just decolonization, which does bring uh, to, the, to the negatives many achievements that we, South Africa, have achieved over the last couple of years, of uh, the last two decades. It is therefore important to also uh, see that this topic uh, today, this evening's topic, deals with decolonization of knowledge, though there may be, be elements of this topic which will then have the broader component of not only decolonization but of Africanization. So, like many topics that we get towards, we all have, uh, you know, I'll try and look at one dimension of this, this topic to this evening, and Mr. Mabuza did indicate uh, this element. Uh, and part of this topic, you know, to give you the diversity of what decolonization of knowledge uh, can include, and you can very quickly realize that you could be here for the next two, three days if I had to touch on all of these topics. So I will be touching on uh, uh, one or two elements of these topics. More recently, uh, Nguji Wachiongo had presented on decolonizing the mind. This was a very powerful talk which he presented at a couple of uh, areas in, in uh, South Africa. And uh, his book, Decolonizing the Mind, uh, talks about language uh, and he mentions, he, there's a number of very nice quotations that he has. Uh, one he has is, uh, you know, use English, but don't be used by the English. I'm going to try and use some of that today. Um, and he also talks about, you know, the power, the power and not of, of, of knowing one's mother tongue, differentiating what that could mean in terms of being empowered versus the contrary to be enslaved. Also, in terms of role models that, you know, we, when we think about role models, we don't always realize that, and, um, you know, we don't always realize and we don't maybe give that breath uh, in, our, in the depth that we uh, educate when it comes to uh, engineering and programs in the built environment, that there are in fact a number of black intellectuals, African intellectuals that have con contributed significantly not only in engineering. Uh, I don't know of how many of you in this room know, for example, that blood banks uh, was something that was developed by an African American. Uh, and there are a number of other components that were simply not as published because maybe the times didn't make them to be correct. Uh, the times didn't allow for those type of publications. So it does mean that some of what we uh, see in the world comes from a uh, limited view. There's elements of the diaspora, there's the transformation aspect, the role particularly of women that have played not only in engineering but in the sciences uh, broadly, but not only in sciences but in society uh, at, at, at length. The geographical boundaries, uh, the element that a number of boundaries that may, be, may be, be developed, including on our own continent, may be created because they look like good maps, good maps also to enable export, but perhaps not uh, you know, to, to move people around, uh, and maybe those considerations are considerations that are taking place in more recent times. The aspects of economics, equity and equality, equity versus equality, and when does versus become end? Uh, and this picture, which is a, which is a picture I, uh, I think gives a good picture, uh, you know, differentiation between equality and equity. Often when we are dialoguing with a number of, of individuals that we often deal with in the University of Johannesburg who are first generation in their families to have the opportunity to access university education, that they indicate to us that this is how they feel. Uh, so they have a very different picture to what, uh, what a number of others. One of my colleagues uh, who leads the, uh, Pan -African, the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation, uh, Professor uh, Ade, Ade, Adekea Adebajo, uh, has often mentioned that part of the problem 
are maybe not a part of the problem, but perhaps part of the solution is that we need to bring about different uh, areas of knowledge, uh, different areas or uh, different paradigms which in fact enable a contestation uh, of epistemologies, a contestation, you know, he talks in terms of the African canon, the Western canon, the Eastern canon, and that it is important to bring about this entire mix in what it is that we do. With, these, uh, with this, I want to bring a couple of pictures because it almost feels that these pictures, if I didn't put these images, you would feel that this is a, an aspect that was perhaps missing to some. But the topic on, of, of economics, and uh, this came about quite prominently over the last, uh, particularly in 2015, when we started to have more challenges in terms of, of growth of eco economy, it's usually when you start looking around and you start looking at, at images. We also had Thomas Piketty that visited us uh, to deliver the Nelson Mandela Memorial Lecture. And what this image shows is that, you know, in South Africa, the top 1% of earners uh, continue to hold uh, sub-19% of the total income. And you will find there are interesting uh, aspects on patterns in history uh, that reflects this. Similarly, the top 10% of earners hold 65% of the total wealth. There was some other data which dealt with uh, relating the tax and the, the asset ownership, but I was not comfortable enough uh, whether the data was reflecting correctly because it's actually very difficult to measure uh, wealth and especially if you take it only from the perspective of tax. Um, but why is it that we tend to suddenly look at it? Why did hashtags become more uh, accessible? Yes, also due to t Twitter, but also because we are actually we are actually in tougher economic times. And when times become tough, you start to see that the world and we all start to look more inwards. And we saw components of that uh, in the in the U.S. When I prepared this, pr this presentation, I also said France, but clearly the French have, have taken a different route. In terms of inequality, uh, Thomas Piketty in his book uh, presents the relationship between the growth of income versus the growth of wealth, where he simply says that the latter will always tend to supersede the former. And thus, uh, the, and thus, unless that these inequalities are addressed, they will continue, uh, if left to its own uh, growth, these, uh, the gap or the inequality will in fact continue to grow. And so he also argues that it is not only the deterministic aspects of economic theory that govern you know, how things will be in terms of uh, political, cultural, social, socioeconomic aspects, but it would in fact also be uh, aspects that do, does deal with, uh, with politics or political or policy reforms. Um, he does indicate that left to its own devices, the economy is, li is likely to generate forces that will uh, drive towards the in inegalitarian uh, and will have destabilizing outcomes on economy. Compounding all of this is the impact of automation, uh, the impact of uh, the fourth industrial revolution that is upcoming. And in this presentation, I've almost said inequality versus the fourth industrial revolution. And you would say, Clearly he meant to say inequality and, or did he? Um, because there will be aspects, there will be uh, places in this presentation where you will see this difference between verses and and coming up. Um, but it does bring about a, a question, and in Piketty's text he actually says that this uh, will actually mean that again, if left to its own uh, devices, then this will mean that the growth in inequality could actually grow. There are, uh, again from his text, two factors that uh, one is, uh, uh, that can change this. So one aspect is to deal with government intervention and the other is to have a rapid burst in economic growth. A number of the aspects that we currently deal with today in South Africa, uh, things like ratings agencies, does have an impact on the first part. Government intervention, I know uh, that there are uh, many elements that we sometimes look at and uh, there are elements that we also look at negatively. Uh, however, if one, you know, I had a look at the Gini coefficient and I said the Gini coefficient in uh, representing inequality is one, representing a more e uh, equitable society is zero. Uh, South Africa sits at 0.7. Uh, it is seen in many respects as a more une unequal uh, society glo in, uh, globally. 
however, if I take the aspect of just one aspect of uh, the social grants into this, it doesn't say that you know that means things are good and let's leave it to its its chance and character because there are components such as the labour market that that has an 80% plus component at least by one estimate and there are different estimates. If you feel depressed, just keep looking until you get to the right statistic. Um, on, on this note, uh, a, a quotation from Martin Luther King Jr. that, uh, you know, especially right now, and we all have these tendencies because you look at things uh, in economics, uh, some of you may be looking at things in the political space, and it, it tends to build this uh, feel of depression. But the problem is, probably the biggest catalyst, at least in my view, of depression is depression. And we have to be able to guard ourselves away from that and continue to take an approach of building hope. I'm going to, to have a couple of disjointed topics which I'm going to then try and bring together. So you would say, you know, why did the Dean talk about decolonization today, which has a more national uh, component, and why didn't he talk about globalization? Um, and I'll come back to this, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about globalization, and then I'll, I'll come, uh, come out of it, is that here are the networks, these are the global transportation networks. Uh, you can see the world is more connected than ever before. Um, if you look at the world connected through Facebook, some people say and recognize as one of the largest countries in the virtual world. Uh, again, very, very deep colored in some parts of the, of the world. Um, if you look at the connectivity by physical infrastructure, whether it's through flights, whether it's through uh, trains, shipment, again, it's, it's a growing world. This is not representing uh, big data, but it probably is because there's also data that, that flights carry. An interesting image is this one, which shows how the GSM networks has penetrated. This was, the, you know, if I look at the other ones, there are a couple of gaps. Uh, this one, the gaps are only uh, in the ocean, probably because the dolphins are not yet communicating. But by the way, they are very good communicators, and I was reading a, a, a theory from information theory that if aliens had to communicate uh, to the world, they would probably see dolphins as better communicators than human beings. Um, then I'm going to move over to another slightly feeling of disconnected topic on the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, as you know, uh, from Kofi Annan, developed during his term as in the seventh, when he served as seventh secretary general to the United Nations, uh, he drove and developed these eight uh, Millennium Development Goals adopted uh, September 2000. Uh, by a number of countries, including South Africa, and the aspect of eradicating extreme poverty uh, was there. Uh, just for those of you that may not know, uh, Kofi Annan was a graduate of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana, uh, and uh, his and it's a university that often is uh, engages with also institutions in South Africa, including uh, UJ. Um, and there were a number of topics such as, you know, it's uh, uh, goals, uh, that of eradicating poverty, that of being able to reduce the number of uh, indi uh, individuals that don't have access to, to sanitation, double the access of those that have access to water. And when you think about this, uh, the, a number of these global goals uh, were achieved, some were achieved in 2010 ahead of its time. Um, and it brings, uh, you know, the aspect of extreme poverty, uh, including for South Africa, was something that, uh, that, redu that was reduced at least by these global standards. And you can see drastic changes, 1990 from 47% to 14%. We're not looking at actual numbers here because the global population also changed. The question was, are we there yet? And if you look at these eight uh, goals, they actually expanded certainly, you know, the access to water, for example, if I just take that one as an example, it's not uh, yet achieved to the global community. So the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by the United Nations September 2015, and again South Africa is one of the signatories to this, uh, adopted this, and an interesting point about the Millennium Development Goals was that if you look at some of these numbers, you know, the quest was, you know, can we double the number of uh, people that have access to clean water? Can we half the number of individuals that don't have access to uh, proper sanitation? So the, the, a number of those items dealt with the 50% uh, type of component, whereas the Sustainable Development Goals uh, has, a, has a bit of a change, much more ambitious aim for 2030, which moves into ending poverty in all its forms and everywhere. 
And so this is really a much more ambitious goal and the number of goals are more. But there are uh, interesting linkages to these goals. Uh, so for example, if you look at uh, quality education and reduced inequalities, and I'm going to give you an example from a, a project that I had interacted that we had worked with within IEEE, uh, the framework of engineering projects and community service, which I'll talk about later. And one of the, the experiences that we had was we looked at bringing about uh, water connectivity in a, rural, uh, in a rural area. And so we had the solution and the solution was, was destroyed. And most of you that have looked at similar theories on the continent you would, or in other emerging economies, you would say, well, it was also because typically women went to uh, fetch water and, when the, and that was a social activity. And uh, the fact that that social activity was taken away by making provision of water in the neighborhood, uh, that was the main reason why this vandalism occurred. However, if you look deeper into this, Part of the responsibility was also that when women, particularly teenagers, were going out to fetch water, yeah, maybe the social component uh, aspect to it, but another aspect to it was also that they were some, not somewhere else. They were not in their classrooms. They were not in education. They were not in secondary schools. They were not in primary schools. This meant that there was an aspect of education that they didn't benefit from, and that actually enabled and, in fact, ended up propagating inequality knowingly and, in some cases, unknowingly. So these goals, uh, you, know, so, you know, someone said, you know, what are the six that you would focus on? And it's difficult to say which six because these are actually yeah, interlinked. Uh, although, you know, there may be some that we may be able to, uh, you know, have more resourcing on uh, than, than others, maybe because of the own uh, venue that we take when we join the particular area of, of work. So if we look at the aspect around just water, then the aspect around water, the, you know, I, I gave the, in the example that the world's ability to uh, develop access to water increased to, some, uh, to over 50%. Um, and, you know, there will be a time when we try to move over from 50% to 80%, and perhaps that is achievable. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of my own background. Uh, I grew up in a place called uh, Little Akane in Botswana in the Central District. Uh, and it was quite normal for uh, places and o occasions when there was no water. Uh, and in fact, uh, you had to be able to, to filter water. And uh, I, you know, if you grow up as a child, you don't really uh, filter water. And I do have good benefits of that, by the way. My immune system is a lot better uh, than, uh, than folks that I sometimes travel with on the continent because I don't often see them at breakfast because they've had water in the wrong air, in the, from the wrong way. Hey. So one finds that uh, when you actually move over to South Africa, uh, you actually, uh, or if you return to South Africa, if you're somewhere else to, uh, in the apartheid time, you'd actually find that these uh, differences uh, become more prominent. And I must say that occasionally uh, I find that we complain too much, but maybe that has advantages too. But when we move, say, from 57% to 80%, there may be a finite component of budgeting that you can do to achieve that. You may have the ability to connect uh, water from certain dams. But when you're moving, trying to move over to 100%, when you're trying to get to that last mile in terms of reaching those that are the poorest in the nation, then you actually realize that these individuals may not be th those that are, in fact, going to have the affordability to invest into more complex central systems that you may want to place. Uh, uh, and thus, the, the, thus, you realize that some of these things require an infinite budget, which we often don't have. So, uh, as you know, uh, there was a saying that said that where there is a will, there is a way. Uh, South Africa's uh, Wade van Niekerk changed this to say that where there is a way, there is in fact a weight. And so there is always a weight. Sometimes there is also a weight. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which is also a theme that we have adopted in the faculty and a number of thematic areas have developed out of this, sometimes feels like this doing to the world and sometimes our own world, but sometimes to the world of an individual. I want to give a picture of electrification. Uh, and if you look at the continent, you notice that there is uh, certain parts of the continent that are more lit than others. And I think that part of the reason is that the uh, electricity systems was, you know, you would look at, you know, a more centralized approach. You may have an ESCOM, you may have a, a, dear, you know, a more regulated approach that will look at where is the most optimal place to invest and will uh, take its distribution networks to those areas. 
areas. Um, and uh, uh, however, if we, in contrast, compare that to the mobile network, this is an old image. But uh, the mobile network, and excuse the pun, maybe due to its wireless nature, seems to have uh, moved into more parts of the continent. Again, if you remember the earlier image, it was one that had a much wider coverage uh, globally. Uh, and it, it appears that this decentralized approach, or maybe this hybrid approach, uh, where you may have you know, fiber and then an, a, a, another set of technology to take you to the last mile, a hybrid combination, uh, it seems that the last mile, and it seems that if you do want to reach the poorest in a nation, then you do need to have a combination of technologies. Uh, there are several examples uh, of works like such that are also happening in the, at the university, but also in the country. Um, so so it's, it's not uh, totally new thinking, but the thinking is to think in terms of decentralized solutions. And it, it appears that our topic today deals with decolonization. And the decentralization and the decolonization, it appears, at least to me, that the first three characters are overlapping. And it seems that we should use that to our advantage if we want to look at decolonizing the knowledge of no decolonization of knowledge, because that seems to be an approach that can enable us to reach at reasonable, not infinite costs, those that are most underserved uh, in, in South Africa and in other parts of the continent, as well as in the emerging parts of the economy. Maybe some of you read this. Do you read this? Opportunity is nowhere, right? Okay, you're reading again because you knew this was a trick question. <laughs> you knew this was a trick question. You knew this, right? Because now you're reading it as opportunity is now here. And I think that we tend to traditionally uh, read things as opportunities no, nowhere, and uh, maybe this also because uh, we are uh, usually uh, sometimes a bit more depressive. Um, and uh, I bring about a quotation from Kwame Nkrumah, who talks about the notion of African unity. I'm always uh, uh, you know, reminded that this has changed now, but I, a few years ago, when you come into uh, Oartamba International Airport, you find that there is a place uh, for South Africa passports uh, and there was another place that says uh, African passports so once I, ar I arrived uh, and the South African queue was very long so I went into the African passports and uh, and the gentleman from immigration then said but uh, you know this is uh, for African passports and I said, but this is a South African passport. <laughs> and <laughs> it was quite interesting because I realized that I'm having to explain to somebody that South Africa is actually in Africa, <laughs> right? And I didn't go into Africa, I, you know, into other parts of Africa when I went into, to, to say, for example, to Zambia or Zimbabwe. Um, which uh, then I, I uh, of course, by the way, if you go there now, it says uh, other African passports. <laughs> yeah. What you do also see is that there are a number of opportunities that, uh, that arise, uh, unique opportunities, because they are unique problems which we can solve on the continent. You may notice that this is not Facebook uh, uh, as a solution here, which uh, interesting enough, our, uh, our, our guest speaker at one of the graduation ceremonies, Stafford Marcy, the other day said that you may not find a Facebook of uh, coming out from Africa. You may find it, but you may find solutions dealing with water, water transport, energy, ICT uh, infrastructure, and sanitation being more prominent in what comes out. Uh, going into a slightly different component of the presentation, I'll try and relate it all together, is that uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who has been an advisor to the United Nations on sustainable development, you know, if you think about uh, our programs in engineering, uh, and a number of you I recognize come from engineering, some of you might come from humanities, what you would realize is a, our approach has traditionally been you know, more technology oriented. Uh, in engineering disciplines, you would find that there is a component of humanities and social sciences. In some cases, it's, it's lighter than others. But we don't always look at these dimensions where technology intersects uh, economics. Uh, as, and, and even if we do, we may not be thinking about how does the, the at the same time, what is the overlap with the social dynamics? What is the overlap with the environment? And what about geopolitics? Uh, you know, yes, you know, let's say that you know, some of our neighboring countries have had 
problems maybe due to political reasons. What about the reasons due to drought? You know, how does this, you know, this seems to be a multiple variable problem. It starts to look like a systems engineering uh, program. There are even these, uh, these Venn diagrams. I, I will tell you that I had not seen the systems engineering uh, presentation before this, but of course uh, it appears that engineers uh, and people in built environment and project management may have a greater feel uh, because these disciplines uh, are coming together. Um, but our programs in its hard areas tend to build silos. Um, I have had our own experiences. I must say that uh, to, in a large respect, I think that the University of Johannesburg does recognize multi- and cross-disciplinary areas. But there's a, huge, there's a much longer uh, uh, path that we also need to follow. Uh, and I, uh, you know, sometimes I think that our education system has aspects like this, where we ask the fish to climb. Uh, and then, of course, we say, well, you have failed. And I think... Um, you know, I don't know. You know, there are there are examples that in my own career, in you know, and I'm actually recognizing some of my former students here who did uh, a module with me, electronic engineering design, where you know groups of designers and examiners ended up uh, you know giving a you know a, a result of say 50% because they just thought a certain student was just good enough. At, at you know, on hindsight, when I think about this, I just think that the examiners in these in these specific cases actually got the 50% because we evaluated the scenario in without understanding the co context and one such example that comes to mind was a student from Rwanda who had such a big deal about generating uh, electricity using the dynamo effect from a bicycle which uh, a lot of our uh, examiners didn't see it as a big deal uh, by the way this guy uh, has one of has a fairly large firm and he produces this and uh, a few years later he asked me if there are not students uh, from Rwanda uh, that can uh, uh, that are looking for jobs. And I then said, yes, uh, there may be, I will have to check. And he said, well, I have a big firm, you know, we're really generating electricity for people in rural areas, and we have run out of people. And I realized that, gosh, this was the guy that we gave 50% a few years ago, the same project. <laughs> So, so changing the thinking, uh, you know, I've really put a tilt on the eye. It seems that innovation needs to come and invade us a bit. So here are a couple of examples. Uh, by the way, this is, you know, there's an economic freedom component to it. It's not, got nothing to do with uh, these presentations, as you know, have a, a really apolitical. But there's an innovation freedom uh, component that's, uh, that I'm going to try and pitch here. From the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, a, a quote that came about was an old Chinese pro proverb, you know, give a person to fish and you've fed the person for a lifetime. So you think, okay, well, let's teach the person to fish. We have, to, we have fed him for a lifetime. Uh, probably in the global economy, economy today, we need to teach the person how to process and package fish to export and market it such that we have, in fact, stimulated economic growth. But you do too much of it, you've had an impact on the environment. So it's really, again, a multivariable problem. Um, at the University of Johannesburg, uh, by the way, I'm paid by the University of Johannesburg, so I do need to say a couple of things from on the university. Uh, the university adopted global excellence and stature as its strategic goal a few years ago, 2013, November, and a set of strategic objectives dealing with research and innovation, teaching and learning, internationalization, and so on. Um, but if we take the word learning and expand it, and you ask yourself, what is it that it means? You know, there's the traditional components of research, communities, probably industry, but then you start to think about industry as a laboratory, and you also think about industry as an employer. We have a big uh, n number on how many of our graduates are employed by industry. And there's also that an aspect that we have brought in right now, which deals with policy because there are certain uh, master's degree dealing in mineral resources, mineral economics, mineral governance that are actually bringing about policies because we found and I found some of my uh, engineers that are in industry that felt to be, uh, uh, you know, they, they felt that they were victims of uh, policies that were written by individuals from uh, political science or individuals from, uh, certain, you know, from the humanities. And I said, well, you can't be a victim 
victim of your own success. We actually have to be able to uh, be part of the solution. And so there are graduate programs now that are starting to develop the component of policy. And I hope that we'll be able to engineer the landscape that we wish to, uh, that we will eventually uh, take part in. Innovations is coming, uh, you know, as a layer. Uh, and you will notice that, you know, the future reimagined, you've probably seen it a few times. It's a future that we will create. The non-governmental organizations, so this model of vertical integration eventually then impacts the community, but it is uh, initiatives that are in fact bottom-up, and these are initiatives that will come about to tell you or you know, give you an indication that we're actually maybe not having uh, sanitation, and you would say, well, what about putting a two-liter water bottle upside down as part of uh, the way that toilets are constructed in certain parts of, of uh, the toilet business is a big business. If you don't believe me, look in the newspaper last year, particularly. Um, and municipalities could be so that you know you could have some changes and chops it you know, to this model. But the key thing is about uh, you know universities. We traditionally do math and science, and that will certainly continue to do so. But it's about bringing in those multiple viewpoints, multiple uh, variances that actually takes engineering into communities and takes math into communities, takes science into communities, and perhaps to many of our students who we receive in the first year. To give you an idea. Idea, our, the University of Johannesburg this year received 31% uh, of students who come from Quantal 1-2 schools. These are the poorest in the nation. And in many cases, when you speak to a learner, you'd realize that this learner is actually, you know, he's the learner that actually got, uh, you know, three or four distinctions and out of a school of five, 600 students. And you really realize that if this individual was in another part of the country and with maybe more resources, what achievements this individual could have in fact attained. So when we are looking at these, you know, these individuals have, you know, sometimes bring to us not only problems, but in fact, they are the ones that generate solutions for these, this group. I'm taking a project to give you a feel. There have been a couple of projects that have been in Gauteng. This is a project that uh, I was directly involved in, in Imasu Tandani in the Western Cape, interestingly enough, with the University of Cape Town. And this, is, uh, this project was sponsored by the IEEE. There are actually three IEEE presidents uh, in this image. And this group worked with, it was really a, a project that deal, dealt with solar electrification. And when our master student, who is now a doctorate grad, Dr. David Oadokun, when he interacted with the community, it was really interesting because the, the, the orphanage, uh, Imasu Tandane is an orphanage that had at the time some 64 uh, orphans from parents that passed away due to HIV or AIDS related infections. And what was interesting was that when David started to interact with this, our group started to interact with this, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the person that led this initiative explained to us, you know, our electricity bill is really high. And we looked at outside the area that there were lots of connectivities to other parts of, of uh, the, you know, from this home to other uh, uh, homes within the, uh, or houses within the same location. And we quickly realized that it's not such a matter of simply plugging them out because there was a cultural aspect of how these groups uh, worked together uh, and it would all be damaged. Uh, it, it was illegal, but it had to still be explained and understood in that context. So when our students started to engage, we really started to see a very different picture of how this whole environment works. Um, for th th thereafter, we started to look at solar solutions. We realized that maintenance would be a problem. But what was amazing was there were, there were some 60 uh, uh, l learners that were some in primary and some in secondary school. And we took them to the University of Cape Town on one occasion. In fact, I think it was July 2011 or 12. And one of the learners said, you know, is this another country? It was almost so disconnected, right? They were 15 kilometers apart. And we took some learners from the University of Cape Town, students from the University of Cape Town to this area that, to do the project. And they just couldn't, they couldn't believe it. And it occurred to me that I then said, what, do you have an idea? And one person had a, a, a distinction, and this could be anywhere. It's not only at UCD, it could be at, at UP, it could be at UJ. And I said, do you have an idea of what it costs, what are the kilowatts? Uh, what is the cost of kilowatt hour? And the students had no idea. We, t we, got, we, we got taught what. We got taught what now. We didn't get taught what percent. We didn't get taught what and how it varies depending on the area you are in. 
they didn't even realize that there were certain compounds that were free for certain areas, let's say for water. So there were very interesting uh, things that, that got uh, developed. You can see there was a solar-based solution after that, which had a maintenance component, which was done remotely. But you would be asking, and I can see a couple of my friends from the Engineering Council of South Africa, uh, because you also came to, to see me in great worry that this dean is going to talk about uh, changing the curricula and what are we going to do. Uh, and, uh, but here, here is the thing, that we are not actually misaligned in any way when it comes from accreditation point of view. Uh, interesting, it appears that the accreditation, when we think about it from an exit level outcomes perspective, then sustainability and impact of an engineering activity is one of the graduate outputs. Professionalism is, an, a, is a component. Independent learning is a component. Uh, engineering management is a component. I'll give you a, a, another example. I once uh, was returning from Andola and I met some of my students in the bus, you know, you, in, in the taxi, which sometimes feels longer than the flight to Andola. And when I met, met these students, I obviously had the time to chat with them. And I said, how did you guys do? You know, what were you guys doing in Andola? And they said, well, we're expanding the network of a particular mobile station. And I said, so how did it go? And they said, gosh, everything was going well. But you know, we got thrown out of a meeting with a, with a rural chief. And I said, gosh, how did you guys manage that? And they said, well, you know, we didn't realize that looking at them directly in their eye, you know, the eye contact stuff that you guys taught us at the university, it didn't seem to go very well with that chief. <laughs> Yeah, he told us to, they told us to, to leave uh, because, uh, the, you know, and we very quickly realized that, gosh, this was one of our criteria for determining how confident you were when you were doing a presentation, <laughs> right? Uh, this morning, uh, the reason why I said Khoimora earlier, because I'm still caught in the many events that a dean participates in a day, and I had a graduation ceremony for the Faculty of Health Sciences earlier, and uh, I was remembering how the handshake was very soft, depending on the different students that you were. I had 200 plus students, and I realized how different it was. Uh, and I realized that, and very quickly you start to realize that, gosh, that uh, what may be uh, that we see in the mirror is not how the world sees, maybe not even the emerging nations, not just these. No, and you very quickly realize how different South Africa is just through the process of handshaking. Uh, so, so as a university, I think you should also ask us, you know, what is it that we're doing in terms of moving talk to action? And we have moved to develop a number of our coursework, master's degree, to also include sustain the sustainable mining by coursework, also by research work. Uh, there's the governance stuff, there's the sustainable energy, five faculties, economics, uh, humanities, sciences, uh, the engineering all come together, the law that will come together. Students will be from all these areas that will be in one classroom uh, and I hope they come up with something sustainable. Sustainable urban planning and development, it's been passed by the Council on Higher Education. It's a long process, I put this in uh, just, just to remind myself that this will actually kick in very quickly. But these are multidisciplinary uh, initiative. There's cognitive science there as well, but that has another component that deals with the industry uh, 4.0 uh, aspect. We're really thinking about it as 5.0 because we're seeing some uh, lacks in the 4.0 aspect. Um, but again, uh, you know, partnerships uh, within Africa. Uh, by the way, some of the things I, I said are also have links uh, to the USA. It doesn't stand for United States of Africa. <laughs> uh, but it could. But the challenges that we have is, uh, you know, actually, I'm going to pick on, but I'm, I, I, well, I don't have his permission, so I'm not going to say his name. But we were working on a paper for a conference uh, on decolonization broadly, so it was not only of knowledge. And we realized that there are very few books um, that, you know, if you take a second year text in dynamics or statics, uh, that, you know, they will be describing merry-go-rounds. Uh, and, you know, you ask about merry-go-rounds uh, to a number of students that come from rural areas, they've really never seen it. And there's a disconnect, disassociation. But if you take maybe some examples from the mining environment or from other environments that is more common, uh, perhaps bicycles or other, uh, other examples, then you start to realize that we actually have a shortage of text that have built uh, bottom-up. It's really significant. Uh, you know, I, I used to teach classes in my former life with students of more than 1,500 uh, students at one time in a module called Electric Circuits. 
Some of you may actually remember me from that time. And uh, you, you may recall there was a, no, well, I hope you don't recall because then you've got very good memory. But there was a chance, there was a time when I asked uh, students about the author of a particular textbook. And I said, where do you think this, this author was from? And, uh, you know, people started to guess, uh, you know, the author's name was Math, Math uh, Sudiku. And they all, of course, concluded that this must from, be uh, from the United States. I mean, where else can it be? And then I asked the individuals to turn the book upside down, out the other side, uh, the back cover, and when they looked at it, they suddenly realized, oh my goodness, this person actually comes from, the, from Nigeria, from a Sadiq, who's a Nigerian name, and has, of course, as in many cases, has, uh, you, you sort of migrate, and then you are imported back, and then you become the best uh, service or product. And this was one of the things, and the students just could never associate that that is even a possibility. Uh, and so you start to realize the book again by Nguji Watyongo is that there's the decolonizing the mind is really a deep topic and uh, if I go into that depth I, I can really go for quite some time. Uh, so again, the scholarship of you know, writing books and publications is clearly an uh, opportunity from a knowledge base. But I think when we are working in communities, we are going to start to generate knowledge that's going to start to enable us to reflect in dimensions that is bottom up, that will decentralize our approach. And I think that when we start to do this, we will maybe not by design, maybe even sometimes by coincidence, but because we like to think that we eventually what we are doing will have that impact, I think it will actually end up stimulating an activity that will, we will find we have in fact not necessarily looked at the destination, because I really don't know what the destination is. But it seems that by embarking on the journey of decolonization of knowledge, we will perhaps create new, the journey will lead to journals, will lead to aspects of publications. So I take those uh, strategic objectives that I presented earlier, and I take the learning component, and the, the purple is uh, what is the future reimagined, and you will notice that you know, we have research, but now it's looking at contextualized research. It's not taking away the global aspect, but it's saying, can we also add something that has a, a more meaning in, the co in our own context? Mr. Mabuza, in his introduction, uh, associated me with millimeter wave electronics, microelectronics. All of that work that happens goes up in, in the space, uh, and it has a real impact from a curiosity-driven component of, of knowledge, which is also quite important. But there's the application component where not everybody realizes is that the imagery that this approach might bring might have an impact on remote sensing that might enable us to have better patterns of vegetation which becomes more complex uh, due to climate change. I appreciate that the American president has solved climate change uh, but as you know the rest of the world has yet to do that uh, including France. Um, Community was an aspect there. Now you will notice that this is moving into community-oriented partnerships. You will notice that there's industry as a laboratory, which is, you know, can we start, you know, looking at, you know, particularly when I joined the university, everybody came with, you know, they said, well, he's a new dean, let's ask him for requests. He'll probably not know we've asked for this before, and he might just say yes. And so I had a couple of colleagues that approached me, I'm looking at some of you now, and they said, well, can you do this? Can you do that? What about this? What about this lab here in my corner? What about this other corner? And what one starts to realize is that laboratories are, yes, important in a university, and you should have some of them that especially look at you know, the long-term components, the curiosity-driven components. But there are many, there's many other areas of research that can, in fact, be embedded uh, in, in society. And how is it that, you know, how do we do this so that we start thinking about society as the laboratory uh, obviously with its, uh, with, within its constraints and keeping in mind that what we do will have social impact uh, as well. Uh, it also occurred to me that you know, engineers take modules from humanities, but the humanities don't always take modules from engineering. Uh, it feels to me as a great lack, uh, and I really mean it, because everybody tells me that due to the lack of world wars, we have improved and increased the lifespan. I believe that the fact that more people have access to clean water probably has had a greater impact, and I'm sure that many of you here believe that. Do people know that? Probably not. Maybe engineers didn't do a very good job in speaking to the folks in the rest of the, uh, of the university and, and, in the, in, in, and maybe even in the world. 
Um, the component of employability that I mentioned earlier, we have traditionally looked at it uh, from a, you know, an employee perspective. I think in this case, uh, I will actually say, uh, I think I can use you, Jabu, as an example, because you once said that, you know, I used to go there for an interview uh, with my potential, my, with my, with my so-called employers. Today, they come to me to collaborate. Uh, and uh, this has changed the approach from employer to employee, and I think that we have to start thinking away from that opportunity is nowhere and start stop thinking about who's going to create my job but to actually be the creators of those jobs and this of course will have an important component of innovation because I, I you know if you think about economic growth it's really tough times you know we are more connected than ever before we are realizing that there's industry uh, 4.0 uh, on the surface uh, in fact we are already in it to some extent so how you know economic freedom uh, how do we achieve that if we don't do something different if we don't have that component that you know instead of being defined by the wave if we don't define the waves and it seems that that example for example in the in the instance of that fish uh, if we don't take those stimuli back into our curricula, it looks like we will continue to be caught. And I think that the sustainable development goals and the quest to reach the, the last 20% gives us that catalysis. It gives us the, those areas where we start innovating and we start scaling up on the bottom end of the Gini, the Gini index, if I can put it like that, uh, in terms of developing innovations that will help to, uh, shape, to reshape uh, aspects of, of economic uh, growth, but a bottom up in addition to uh, in, in initiatives that may come from government. But let's not wait. Let's not wait. We are very good at waiting. Um, so I put a spin on this. And this is when I say that I also thank Incosia and, and SAIE, because this is when you see that the UJ logo is not here, because I don't think that as a university executive I'm allowed to change the strategic goal. But our strategic, the, the UJ strategic goal is global excellence and stature. It almost seems that there's an opportunity for us to evolve this to global excellence and stature. 